Let's get started. Welcome to this public lecture by the Grantham Research Institute on Climate Change and the Environment. My name is Robert Faulkner. I'm the research director at the Grantham Institute. And uh, our topic tonight couldn't be both more important and uh, big and demanding how to fight climate change, economic and technological challenges. Admittedly, a massive topic, but we couldn't have hoped for a better speaker to address this topic, Professor Hans Werner Sinn. Let me briefly introduce him, and I should add it's a great pleasure to do this, because as he's just found out, I was a student of his in the 1990s. <laughs> Professor Sinn is, and there can be no question about that, one of Germany's eminent economists. He's a towering figure in the discipline, but also in public debates, and he's been a long-standing and much sought-after advisor to governance, governments in Germany and beyond. Professor Sinn spent most of his academic career at the University of Munich from 1984, when he held for the first time a chair in economics there, until his retirement in 2016. Alongside his regular duties, he also created and directed the Center for Economic Studies there at the university, and then became the director of the IFO Institute, one of Germany's leading economics research think tanks. Professor Sinn's, Professor Sinn's academic work is both wide-ranging and hugely influential in the discipline. He received many awards from universities, from states. Uh, he has, for several years in a row, and this is a fine achievement, for several years in a row, top the F8 said, the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung's ranking of German economists. They are ranked according to academic achievement and public influence. And being in so-called retirement, I just looked it up, he's still in the number three slot in that ranking. Part of Professor Sin's success as a public intellectual is clearly his willingness to engage in public debates and controversies. There are a few public policy issues that he hasn't made an important and often controversial contribution from the question of how to get German unification right, what to do about the euro. His book, The Euro Trap, is a big success. How to restart the German economy with his book, Can Germany Be Saved? Question mark. I think some are writing this, these kind of book titles about Britain at the moment, I might add. He's engaged also, and most critically for us tonight, in environmental and climate debates. The Green Paradox came out in 2012 in English. It's highly recommended. It deals with the paradox that if you start restricting fossil fuels, they might become used and exploited more readily and more quickly. So let me close here. But before I do that, I just want to add one bit of information that is not found in official biographies of Professor Sin. I've mentioned that I was a student of his and I enjoyed him as by far the most inspiring lecturer in economics at Munich University. But I'd like to add, and I use this opportunity wisely, that he's also a tough examiner. Um, I, I do remember the expression that he gave me when I gave him a clearly nonsensical answer in the oral exam. Uh, I'm not going to reveal the grade that I got. I don't want to embarrass myself. I think this is being recorded, right? Okay. <laughs> And I very much hope that Professor Sin has long forgotten what it was that I said and what grade he gave me. So, with that out of the way, Professor Sin, we are most grateful that you've made your way to the LSE. Please do all join me in welcoming him to this lecture. I was not too nasty. I do not remember, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for the invitation to speak here about uh, climate policies. There are people who are more expert in the field than I am, but I have taught uh, environmental economics for many decades, uh, being a public finance economist, and 
I also uh, wrote a couple of papers recently. In earlier decades I did that, but also recently. And I want to inform you here about uh, two aspects of uh, this debate which I find essential and I refer here uh, to my own work. I do not want to go into the question of whether or not there is global warming. I think it's clear that there is global warming. Uh, the evidence is, uh, is really alarming. Uh, we have already uh, increased the CO2 content of the atmosphere by one third. Uh, the temperature has increased by one degree Celsius from pre-industrial -in times. Uh, there is evidence from uh, measure measures uh, by satellites that measure the back radiation and the hole which comes through CO2 uh, becomes bigger and bigger. So there are obvious uh, indicators that the thing is going on. And some people who uh, don't believe <coughs> uh, that there is such a thing as, as uh, the back radiation uh, phenomenon go to a mountain if you are standing at the top of a mountain, it's cooler than in the valley. It's not cooler because the air is thinner, that's not the reason. It is because the back radiation is less at the top of the mountain. It's water in the atmosphere that filters out, out the back radiation. Think about it. Uh, I don't want to expand on this. So let's take the <coughs> uh, global warming effect for granted. And uh, let's also assume that it is bad. I think there is evidence enough for that too. There will be big migration on the in the world, which will not be peaceful. And so uh, there is every reason to do something against it. Whether we can have a two degree goal, as some say, or whether we just slow down the process, is a matter of debate. I've also written on that. I th I'm on the slowing down side and others say there must be a, a CO2 budget. I, I, I don't want to discuss that here either. My question is, uh, what are the economic and technical difficulties by uh, trying to fight the climate change? And I want to point you uh, to uh, some facts here which are essential for understanding. First of all, uh, there is a huge effort and little result which we have seen in the world. Uh, the, concerning the technological problems, I want to point you to the volatility problem when, when it comes to weather dependent uh, energy sources like wind and solar energy. It's not so easy to integrate them in the grid. And then I come to the economic problems and uh, speak about the supply side approach rather than a demand oriented policy. Uh, after all, everything you take out of the ground comes somehow into the air and, and we have to look deeper rather than just uh, cutting demand. Uh, carbon leakage, the green paradox, uh, the combination of them, and then I uh, finish with effective policies. So let's look at this. This is Germany. No country in the world, uh, I believe, has gone that far in terms of moving towards green energy as my own country. Uh, you find no countryside in Germany where you won't see these, these windmills, so to say. And uh, they really change the nature uh, of, uh, of, of the whole country. Or here another picture. Uh, uh, close to old ruins and you know. Uh, one really tries a lot. Uh, there are solar panels everywhere. In southern Europe, in southern Germany, you won't find a, a farm without solar panels on it. And other EU countries also do a lot. And uh, here you see that the CO2 output has decreased enormously from 1990 until now by 22% and in Germany it has uh, declined by 27% and uh, the Kyoto reduction target for Germany was 21% so Germany went even uh, substantially below this. Okay, it's 
not only effort, it's the uh, death of the GDR, let's be honest, uh, which contributed. But in addition, there has been a lot of uh, attempt to reduce the CO2 output. However, when you look to the worldwide CO2 output per year, you see very little. Here is 1990. When the European curves are coming down, the worldwide CO2 output is increasing. You see some kinks here. Uh, they have uh, to do with uh, shocks. The first oil price shock, the second one, increased the prices for oil and then there was a recession and the recession in the world meant there was less CO2 output. That's what you see. Here is the Kyoto Protocol. Do you see any result of that? Not really. Uh, this is the beginning of the emissions trading in the EU. Not really. But what you see are these, these uh, kinks here and these are recessions. This is the 82 recession. This is the dot, pum, uh, dot, dot com bubble bursting. Uh, 1991, 92. Uh, here is uh, the Lehman recession just 10 years ago. And this thing here is the BRIC crisis in, of 2015. Uh, I expect we will be going up again because now the world economy is booming again. We don't have the numbers yet, so the error is mine. It's just a, a, a forecast. So that is very disappointing. All these enormous efforts by the European countries are not visible in this aggregate curve. And uh, it, it, it tells us that all this is a difficult subject. The difficulties are technological and economic. Now come, I, I come first to the technological side. And what I find most important is the volatility issue. I just published a paper in the European Economic Review that came out three, four uh, months ago um, on this uh, volatility issue. Because uh, we insist in Germany on this weather-dependent electricity path and I show that it's not so easy. Uh, the volatility you can see here, this is the hourly input of uh, or production of uh, wind power in Germany, the feeding in into the grid in Germany. These are actual data, hour by hour, 8,700 something hours in the year. Hmm? And you see, of course, it's very, very volatile because sometimes there is no wind, sometimes there is a lot. The average production is uh, 5.85 uh, gigawatt and the installed production is the capacity is nearly 36 so the actual production is one one sixth of the installed production okay for um, and the secured production is very very little if you look at 90 uh, uh, at the amount of electricity that is produced in 99.5 percent of the hours of the year, it is close to nil, because sometimes there is no wind. Similarly, solar power, and of course it is volatile because we have the nights, you don't see that here, but it, every day, day it goes to zero, of course. In the summer there is more sun than in the winter, clearly. Here we have um, an average production of 3.7 uh, gigawatts, and the installed capacity is 30.7. So the ratio of uh, actual production on average to installed production is 1 to 10. Not 1 to 6 as with wind. It's even a little worse than there. That's not, not, not a problem. Uh, it's just good to uh, be informed about this. The true problem is the volatility. How to buffer this volatility? The wind <laughs> blows when it wants, not when we need the power. Huh? And the correlation between uh, the wind and our demand for electricity is zero. There is no correlation. And the same is true for the sun. 
in the uh, winter we would need uh, a lot of uh, electricity, but in the winter there is very, very little sunshine, so it's even a negative correlation. That is, that is the problem. We buffer by having double structures. That is, uh, Germany's approach is to have everything twice. So we keep all the old uh, power plants nucle uh, nuclear for the time being, but we want to shut them down gradually. Uh, but we keep fossil fuel power plants, and they have to produce the electricity when there is no wind and no sunshine. And when the wind comes and the sun is shining, then uh, these plants are standing still. It is impossible to have this alone. You, you, you just can do it with the combination of both. So what you save is uh, fossil fuel, but not the fossil fuel plant. You have double fixed costs. You need the costs of these uh, new green plants plus the fixed costs of the old plants. Don't, they don't go away. That's important to realize. All the people employed have to stay put in order to wait f for the time to produce when there is no wind and no sun. And that makes it expensive, of course. Germany has electricity prices which are twice as high as those in France, which uh, partly results from this phenomenon. But this buffering strategy which we have finds its normal limits and that we see here. This is the sum of the two previous curves uh, and scaled down because I, I will add another graph here. This is wind and solar, hourly production in Germany. And here we have demand, load, say the uh, physicians. And uh, the difference between them is produced by ordinary plants. So when wind and solar is there, then their production goes down and fills this gap. So they have to move, uh, they have to be switched on and off just to compensate and fill this gap. The problem though is they are not that flex flexible to be shut down uh, quickly enough sometimes. Because if you see here, then the wind-solar production spikes come close to the downward uh, spikes of the, uh, of the demand curve. And actually, uh, in the year 2014, these are 2014 data, we had 90 days in Germany where in some hours, the price of electricity was negative. Germany uh, tried to get rid of the surplus electricity, trying to sell it to other countries, but the other countries, the neighboring countries, don't want them. They want the electricity. They consider it as waste. It, it destabilizes their grid, and they would only accept this electricity if Germany paid for it. Germany is an exporter of electricity, but in economic terms, it's not an export. It's an import, an import of the service, service to abolish the waste. The problem will become worse if, if we expand the wind and solar power as we want. This is just 16% on average of our uh, aggregate production, 16%. And some people say they want to go towards 100%. Let's make a scaling experiment. And uh, in, in this article, I report on the scaling. Let's uh, just assume we double the wind and solar power. And uh, let's assume we don't have stochastically independent sites anymore because everything is filled already. So if we want to f put more plants, then we have to put them next to where they are already uh, with the same wind situation and the same sunshine, more or less. 
and that would expand these white curves. But now you see we have many uh, uh, periods during the year when the white curves overshoot the yellow demand curves, here, here, everywhere. And here we have a problem. How can we buffer now? We cannot buffer this volatility by just shutting down the conventional plants, because you can shut them down and uh, run them at zero production, but you cannot run them at negative speed. You cannot make coal in a coal power plant if you put electricity into the plant. It does not generate coal. You know, there is a non-negativity <coughs> constraint here, which is trivial but important. And this shows you that if we just double uh, the share of green energy relative to, do, to today, we will enter this territory where we have the overshooting spikes. And if we triple it and quadruple it and so on, there will be more and more overshooting spikes. And these overshooting spikes we will have to buffer in another way. We cannot just buffer them by uh, uh, running uh, existing plants at zero. No? So we need uh, st energy stores. But uh, storing energy is uh, very expensive. Lithium-ion batteries are out of debate, I would say, cost-wise for the time being. Uh, the only possibility which is halfway reasonable is pumped storage plants. And here I did some calculations to find out how much we could possibly store with the pumped storage plants that could be built in Western Europe. These are pumped storage plants. Typically there is an upper lake, there is a lower lake. When there is excess electricity, you pump the water up. And when you need it, the water runs down, uh, runs a turbine, and then you generate the electricity. Germany has 35 of such plants. Other countries also have such plants. In the Alps, you find some of them. The total amount that can be built in Western Europe, uh, according to a big EU project, the Estorage project, published in 2015, which, uh, according to the EU, leads to a new era of smarter energy management, would be 2.6 terawatt hours in the whole of Western Europe, taking the geological possibilities for granted, which the geologists have examined. I looked at various countries and combinations of countries that form a common grid, the so-called common copper plate, to, to, to square that with this storage program uh, to see how much uh, green electricity could possibly be integrated in the net with the existing storage capacity. That is the, the essence of my paper. I don't give you uh, the full results, but just uh, some hint to what uh, I'm doing. This graph shows the problem. Um, here we have the usable wind and solar power market share. Currently we are at 16%. The efficiency is 100% in the sense that none of the spikes have to be thrown away. We can use them all. But when we want to increase the market share, we get these overshooting spikes, and the, then we have a problem. Suppose first we don't use um, energy stores. We throw them away. Actually, Germany does that. In the following sense, if there is a lot of wind and the grid doesn't need it, then uh, uh, the grid company pays uh, the uh, wind solar producers for not producing. They block uh, the rot rotor and they get 
a, a fee as if they were producing at maximum speed. 90% of that they get. It is like throwing it away. So let's first look at the throwaway strategy. Here we are. Suppose now uh, we want to increase the wind solar market share so that with other green energy which we have, it's biomass, uh, hydroelectricity and so on, which is 11% of the total, we make everything green. So we want to move from here towards the 89% uh, share, which is necessary to get rid of the entire fossil fuel. That is possible to some extent. So if you follow my thought experiment and we just double the existing plants, we can do that with hardly any losses. You saw that there were overshooting spikes, but the percentage is minuscule. It is not measurable. It is it's very small. It becomes bigger, though, if we want to increase the market share. And these points have all been calculated. With a lot of effort, I can tell you. And it goes to zero if we wanted to go to 100%. Because, you know, it doesn't help to expand to infinity if sometimes there is no wind and no sun. That is the problem. So, 100% share would mean a marginal efficiency of zero and an average efficiency too. But suppose we go just to this point where we fill the gap remaining with uh, taking other green electricity into account. That is, we go to a market share of 89% then we would have an average efficiency of 39%. In other words, 61% of my green electricity I would have to throw away. And at the margin, for the last step from 88 to 89%, I would have to throw away 94% of uh, the green <coughs> electricity coming from wind and solar if I did not have stores. Now, we do have the storing, storage possibility. What mileage do we get from the stores? The disappointing result is just here. If we even include Norway and all the facilities, the pumped storage plants that could be built there, which is 1.6 terawatt hours out of the 2.6 possible in the entire of Western Europe, yeah, then we wouldn't go beyond 50%. And I considered various country groups that I combine and we, I never go, we never go beyond 50%. 50%, 49 point something is the maximum. That is this uh, somewhat frustrating result coming out of uh, this analysis. Yes, we do get a little bit of help but don't expect that uh, the entire electricity supply in an uh, economy like Germany could come, or in economies like in Western Europe, because I combined a couple of them, could go beyond 50%. My conclusion, only nuclear is possible. If we want to be uh, CO2 free, only nuclear is possible. I don't see alternatives here. It helps a little bit, but it's more for gi giving you a good, good feeling rather than making a major contribution. Let me come to economic problems, because this is a sort of overview uh, presentation rather than uh, looking too deep into one particular paper. The economic issues, um, as I see them, I discussed in a paper which was published 10 years ago. It's a supply side approach to the climate problem. And I, I think it is fair to say it has triggered a little revolution because the uh, IPCC then through Ottmar Edenhofer, who also was one of my students, uh, uh, adopted this uh, carbon budget supply side view which I, which I developed here. Uh, there are two uh, books which later came also out. 
the green, das grüne Paradoxon, which was then translated to English, came out with MIT Press, the, uh, the Green Paradox. So what do I mean here? The trivial fact is that the carbon that ends up in the atmosphere is taken out of the ground. Uh, there's oil, coal, gas, hydrocarbons in the ground. Um, carbon atoms are glued to hydrogen atoms. Um, they burn. The hydrogen is not a problem. It becomes water. It falls down. But uh, the carbon stays in the atmosphere. After burning, most of it goes back to the ocean and into biomass. But some stays permanently, permanently in the atmosphere. And that's in the short term, 45%, short term being 100 years or so. And in the longer term, say 500 years plus, it's a stable percentage of 25. It doesn't go to zero, that percentage. It doesn't geometrically decline to zero. No, one quarter of the carbon that comes out of the Earth stays there more or less forever. Not forever. I mean, after tens of thousands of years, there are some reactions with calcium and so on, but not f important for human beings. And mind, there is no, hardly any possibility to avoid that the carbon which we take out goes to the atmosphere. The, you can't improve the efficiency of engines to reduce the share that goes to the atmosphere. No. The carbon stays carbon. It, once it's burned, it goes to the atmosphere. The question is how much energy you get out of it. That could be more or less depending on the efficiency of your engine. But the carbon stays the carbon. It's a one-to-one -one relationship. Uh, people don't see that trivial point often. They, 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 they think there must be some, some screw which they could change so that out of this carbon which I take out, a smaller percentage goes to the air. Sorry, it's always 100%. And uh, some of it, of course, is absorbed then here, but one quarter stays in the air forever. That is the problem. Okay, sequestration. You can, of course, what you can do is uh, dig a hole or take one which is there and pump it back. That's, but that's the only possibility. That's the only possibility which we have from the technical side. So if we want to reduce the carbon uh, output that goes to the atmosphere, we in principle have two possibilities. We can go here to the users of carbon and say you must use less, or we can go here to the producers and say you produce less. It's the same. It's the same. Yeah? We can either do a demand policy or a supply policy or both. If you think about the public debate, it's all demand. It's all demand. You uh, isolate your home, you run better engines uh, that consume less uh, gasoline, uh, you have uh, better power plants with a higher degree of efficiency. So the idea is we reduce the demand for carbon. But for an economist, and some of you are economists, uh, when you speak about demand, you always have to speak about supply because demand and supply through the price mechanism uh, f find an equilibrium where they are the same. You cannot just think about only one of them. The same carbon here and there. Uh, every economist in an undergraduate of course, uh, learns about supply and demand. So this is the quantity demanded. This is the price. The higher the price, the lower the demand, and the other way around. Let this be the carbon demand curve. If the supply curve is flat, that is, if there is a, a, 
a trigger uh, value of, uh, of, of supply beyond which the, the producers, the oil shakes, are willing to produce as much as you wish and below nothing, then it looks like this. Then a demand curve would work. A demand reducing policy would shift this curve to the left. And of, of course, uh, sorry, the equilibrium point would move to the left. And here, this is the case for uh, reducing demand. But this is not the right picture. Uh, this would be uh, an appropriate picture for car production, say. There is a given unit cost for producing a car, say, and if you reduce the demand for cars, then there will be fewer cars being produced. But here, the thing is different insofar as nothing has to be produced. The oil, the gas, the coal is already there. It's already in the crust. We just have to take it out. It's the price of carbon is a scarcity price, like the price of old Rembrandts. Yeah? They are there, and you can reduce the demand for Rembrandts. It will not reduce the, amount, the number of Rembrandts which are around because Rembrandt is dead. You know, that's the nature of the problem. So we should rather look at this case. There is a given supply of carbon, and if we now reduce the demand, we will simply reduce the market price, period and that will compensate. So our efforts through policy measures to reduce the demand for carbon will reduce the world market price for carbon and that will uh, uh, work against it and compensate it. This is in particular important when you think about measures by an isolated group of countries. Let's split the world into two groups of countries. The abiding countries that uh, signed the Kyoto Protocol, the green countries, and the sinners, the others who don't care. The Kyoto countries demand I show from left to right, and the other countries demand from right to left. And the distance here from here to here is the aggregate production of carbon decided by the oil shakes, by Putin's gas barons, uh, or, or, or oligarchs, or, and, and the coal barons, say. These are the guys who, for whatever reason, let's assume that for a moment, have decided in period T, in year T, to produce this amount. Both have normally sloped demand curves. The Kyoto countries, the non-Kyoto countries have it, and where the sum of the two demands exhausts the supply, we have the world market price of carbon. Suppose now the Kyoto countries curtail their carbon demand by imposing a constraint. They say, no, we don't consume that much. We reduce our consumption up to here. Okay? That is the effective demand curve with government intervention is this one. It, ha it has a vertical uh, branch here. And then this is the new world market price for carbon. What happens is that uh, we drive now a wedge between the world market price for carbon and the domestic price for carbon. Domestically, it is forbidden to use so much carbon. The government imposes a tax, say, or other measures which make carbon expensive. Uh, by reducing our demand, the world market price for carbon goes down. And this is what I call an altruistic wedge, because we help the sinners to get the carbon cheaper than otherwise would, be, would have been the case. Hmm? This is called leakage. So uh, there is a given market for carbon 
in the world and whatever the uh, producers take out of the ground will be sold somewhere in the world. If we don't buy it, somewhere else buys it. Okay? That's the leakage problem. But the problem is actually worse because of the green paradox. What is the green paradox? The green paradox says we cannot even take it for granted that the carbon producers produce a given amount of carbon regardless of our policy measures. It may even be the case that they react by producing more rather than less. Why would they produce more? Because what we do with our green policies is we scare them. We tell them, come on, we won't need you anymore in the future. We have our new green energy sources and we will make sure that no carbon will be used in the future. We do it all differently. If you were an oil shake, how would you react? Extract as much carbon as you possibly can as quickly as possible before the gr new green world is there. So there is an anticipation effect. Uh, Germany, uh, two years ago, uh, had a new law that old art could not be exported. They discussed it at length and then they enacted this law two years later. What happened? All the, 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 the collectors brought their art out of the country before the new law was operating. Of course, here it was only two years, but in terms of the carbon problem, we speak about decades. These are, these are the decades that pass until the whole world has found an agreement about carbon reduction. And in this phase of debate, uh, do we possibly get this countervailing effect of producing more? Green saber rattling, I would call that. Scaring the oil shakes who react by anticipating their sales. Now what happened in 88? There was the World Climate Conference in Toronto. The, one, uh, the IPCC was founded. There was the Kyoto Protocol. There were the green parties popping up in Europe in the 1980s. Greenpeace was founded. Al Gore had this enormous campaign. Uh, the Stern Review uh, alerted the world of this important problem. You know, if you are an oil shake and you realize what's going on here, you better think of what you do with your resources in the ground, rather than waiting for your markets to be destroyed. And you react by anticipating the sales. And then even the Paris Agreement. This can be given a more, um, more um, slightly more theoretical interpretation. Suppose we have an intertemporal equilibrium in the resource market where resource owners uh, plan their extraction so that they would be indifferent between holding their wealth in terms of financial assets, which generate a rate of interest, or in terms of resources in situ, which generate a return in terms of annual capital gains. One calls this the hoteling equilibrium, but you can modify it. It doesn't have to be the strict hoteling thing. <laughs> Let's assume there is such an equilibrium. And this generates this time path of the price of carbon in the world. This is the time, this is the price. At which extractors, resource owners, are more or less indifferent when to sell. Because the present value of a later price is the same as today's price, if we discount this future price at the going market rate of interest. 
Okay, I admit, at the time of uh, the ECB with zero rate of interest, uh, discounting is a difficult thing, but let's assume more uh, that we return to normal times here. Suppose now we um, carry out green policies that, given the extraction path, so whatever is in the background behind the uh, screen here, uh, the annual extraction that generates that, given this time path of physical extraction, we carry out green policies which would reduce the price of carbon because the demand is reduced. <coughs> but we do that only until 2050, say. Thereafter, the policies stop. How would the market react? Well, the resource owners would try to, not to sell here, but shift some of their quantities to the future when the prices are high, even in present value terms, higher than today. So extraction is shifted to the future. If it is shifted to the future, the future prices go down, and the present prices relative to this path coming from policy actions goes up, and uh, then we will have a new equilibrium in expectations where the price of carbon again increases, but it's always a little lower than it otherwise was, would have been, because we have the demand reducing policies in the first place. Okay, this is one possibility. The other possibility is we announce the tough uh, green policies for the future. And policymakers like to do that, you know. We have a zero degree goal, we want to reduce by 80%, but not now, no. Voters, please don't be afraid that we increase your energy prices. No, no, this will all happen in the future, when uh, future generations of policymakers will be dealing with you. Well, that is the typical position which policymakers take. But that means this is the right experiment. From 2050 on onwards, we will have very tough green policy measures, reducing the prices at each point in time relative to what, they, uh, to what they otherwise would have been given the old extraction path. And then the old extraction path cannot be given because it's no longer efficient to stick to this path. Uh, uh, producers will shift extraction to the present we will get more supply here, the prices will go down here, and they will go up here, and this will be the new price path. And I think this is uh, more or less the reality, this latter case. Because the really harsh me measures we postpone to the future, we promise it for the future rather than carrying them out today. That's the green paradox. To be more precise, let delta P be the price wedge at a particular year T, which we generate through demand reducing measures in the future, uh, given the old extraction path. Hmm? We can show that if delta P um, increases over time in present value terms, then we get the green paradox. Okay? If after discounting the delta P, it still increases over time, discounted to the fixed point, uh, present, we get the green paradox. And this is why carbon taxes may not work. Some people say we have to put a price on carbon in order to reduce the demand without discussing what happens to the world market price. It's a view which is very partial analytic. There is a given world market price of carbon. We as a nation impose a tax on it and the consumer price goes up by this tax. It's too simple because if the whole world does that, then it may well be the case that the price is falling and if it is falling in the future more than in the present, because we anticipate more and heavier taxes in the future than today, we get the green paradox. Now let's combine that with leakage. 
This was the leakage diagram which I showed you. Given some, the old extraction path at a particular year, the oil shakes and the others produce so much. That's the old extraction path. We reduce our demand, the good countries, the Kyoto countries, we, Britain, Germany, and all the Western Europeans reduce their demand, and the sinners, the Americans, Trump people, and so on, they don't, you know? Uh, that generates the price decline for them. We help Trump a lot with our demand reducing measures because he gets the energy cheaper. And uh, now we have this price change coming through our policy measures in the world market price. And this price change here, this is our delta P, which is the signal for the oil shakes. If this, this delta P over time increases faster, uh, or increases in present value terms, that is, increases faster than by the rate of interest, then we get the green paradox. And what would the green paradox mean here in this diagram? It would mean that if this is, a few, this is the present, or the near future, to which this diagram belongs, for each point in time we have a similar diagram, but of different width. Huh? Suppose this is a present year, or the, in the near future, and there is the condition for the green paradox, then this will widen. So if delta P in present value terms increases over time, if we look to each diagram from year to year, which we have here, then in the present this will widen. Because the oil shakes will produce more. And this means that the world market price will be even lower than if they did not react. This uh, altruistic wedge which we create gets even bigger because our demand reduction, which is just the beginning of a chain of demand reductions will be, which we will be more in the future, induces the resource owners to produce more and the other countries, the Trump countries, will have a double advantage. First of all, they will be able to consume that amount of the carbon which we do no longer consume. And second, they get the extra carbon which the oil shakes take out of the ground because of the green paradox. And that is a rather frustrating result. Evidence, evidence is difficult, but I point you to two graphs here, which I find interesting. Let's look at the real prices of fossil fuel, coal, from the 1970s. It's deflated by the uh, 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 consumer price index. No price increase, unlike my diagram. Natural gas. You have to go back to the 70s to find a price which is as low as today. And here coal, also to the 70s. From the 19 onwards on, on, there was a long period of declining prices. Here came another spike, but here we are again at a very low price. We don't see an increasing trend in the price. And this could be the green paradox. Because the green saber rattling began here, the IPCC, the green parties, and so on, inducing the oil shakes to increase the supply. And that would be an explanation for this devastating uh, graph which I began with, showing this enormous increase in CO2 despite the fact that Europe does so much and reduces its own CO2 output. Another graph is this one. It's, this is the stocks of lignite, brown coal, lignite, a special type of coal, in various countries. United States, Russia, Australia, they have uh, the largest resources. But look to this country, Germany. 
It's rather tiny. We don't have very much lignite. Now square this with the annual production of lignite. It's on the right-hand side. Where is Germany? Germany is the world uh, champion in terms of lignite production, in terms of the flow of lignite, even though Germany has a rather modest stock of lignite. How come? Yeah, the answer is clear. It's the Greens. Germany is the greenest country in the world in terms of the power of the green movement. And uh, this convincingly scares the owners of lignite so that they hurried up to get out of the ground as much as they possibly can. Because if they wait, <coughs> the resource is no longer accessible. That's the green paradox. So what are the e effective policies? What are the conclusions? Some people say, yeah, well, this may all be true, but we have to do something. The world is getting warmer. We have to do something. And you, you have a frustrating result for me. I want to do something. I don't want to listen to you. But come on. It has to work. If it doesn't work, just to get a good feeling, uh, uh, that's not enough. It really has, to, has to, to bite into the problem. So what is my lesson? First of all, wind and solar you can forget. It does not work. It gives you a little bit contribution, but uh, reaching 50% of the market share would already be an enormous success. Beyond that is hardly possible. And no one will build uh, the pumped storage plants, which the storage project thinks is the geological maximum. Germany tried to build one in Bavaria, and the farmers came and protested, and the government gave it up. So I personally see, fail to see an alternative to uh, nuclear, as ugly as it is and dangerous possibly too. We know that I could, we could discuss that at, at length. Second, what we could possibly do is sequestration. As I said before, uh, rather than letting the CO2 go to the atmosphere, we pump it back to the ground. But unfortunately, there is not enough space in the ground. Uh, if only because the CO2 is so voluminous relative to the carbon. If we take carbon out of, uh, out of the ground and burn it, then the carbon is being combined with oxygen, makes CO2. And the volume, even if we liquidize uh, uh, the CO2 and compress it as much as physically possible, is five times the amount of the coal. Five times. That even if we could fill all coal mines, and, and they would be available for sequestration, only one-fifth of the CO2, which ge is generated by burning the carbon, could be f filled back into the mines. Yes, we can generate a little bit of mileage, but again, not very much. Many people overlook that. Afforestation, of course, the carbon which is in the form of a trunk of a tree is, uh, doesn't harm anything. Rather than burning the area of, of, of island per year in terms of uh, forest, we could uh, reforestate, uh, or what does one say, reforestate yeah? the, the areas and build new, uh, new forests. That would be useful. It's 20%, the burning of the forests is 20% of the, the annual output of, uh, of carbon. And in terms of economic policies, e e economics is about generating incentives so that people really do what they ought to do. What about this? No one has discussed that. We impose source taxes on financial assets. Why? In order to make it less attractive for the oil sheikhs to convert their wealth in situ 
the oil in the ground into a Swiss, or for that matter, London bank account. Yeah? If we impose a source tax on that, then it's less attractive to do so, and there will be an incentive to keep more in the ground. Also, we should secure the property rights of resource owners, because one of the reasons why they overextract is unsecured property rights. Take a normal uh, oil shake uh, sitting on, on, on his property. He cannot be sure that if he does not extract and leaves the stuff in the ground, that his dynasty, his children and grandchildren, will be able to extract. Because in the meantime, the likelihood that there is a revolution and the, their dynasty will be thrown out of the country is very large. And this uncertainty about property rights is an extra reason for extracting too much. If you wish, uh, the conclusion out of this is let the dictators be alive rather than killing them and, you know, destabilizing uh, huge regions. To be honest, uh, I think the Iraq war and every, everything related to it was uh, not only a sin with regard to hundreds of thousands of people who died, but also because uh, it created uncertainty in these regions, property uncertainty, and induced the owners of the resources to speed up extraction. Very little discussion about that in the newspapers. Hardly anything. But I think this is an essential part of the story. And then my last point is uh, what we urgently need is a worldwide emissions trading system of the sort which we have in Europe. Uh, we have this uh, carbon emissions trading in Europe, as you know. I every uh, power plant that wants to emit CO2 needs uh, permits, and the permits are allocated and tradable. And there is a cap being defined by the EU, and that cap defines the aggregate output in the EU. If the EU does that alone, it's completely useless because of the leakage effect, as I showed you. But if we do that for the whole world, it's an entirely different thing. We need to have quantity controls over the carbon. That's my ultimate conclusion. And price signals, sorry, that won't work. Because you are never sure what the expectations about future prices are so that it could backfire and generate uh, a green paradox. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Uh, I invite you all now to challenge Professor Sin and engage in discussion with him. I'll take a few questions at a time so that we can get in as many as possible. Uh, it would also be nice for the speaker, for all of us, if you could say who you are uh, and keep the questions brief so that we can get as many in as possible. So actually, make them questions rather than long statements. That, that's always good. All right. Shall we, where shall we start? I'll start over there and then I'll work my way through the room. Uh, uh, there's a gentleman in the first, second row. Yes, please. Yes, my name is Stefano Bonfa. I'm involved in climatology and health sector. My question is uh, the, in relation with the new analytical tools like big data machine learning, how this will what? change, Sorry. I mean, the analytical tools for let's say, like, like machine learning, big data, in relation of identifying, let's say, the policy to the data also, see how you can better improve the policy, how you can better, the, let's say, allocate it, the uh, activities for energy, for example, climate, and, uh, and uh, for instance, and health. So the question is, more, you, we don't have so much knowledge up to now in order that you can mm -hmm. jump on this type of conclusion if uh, renewable energy is positive or negative, if how the impact it is. How does your, okay. uh, so let's the first say, question your about 
availability of data and in improvements in data analytics. Who's next? Okay, gentleman in the fourth row. Thanks. The assessment with regard to electricity production in Germany and elsewhere is sad enough and certainly what people who study earth sciences are dreading to hear. But you haven't even mentioned something which is more important than electricity itself, which is heating, process heat and transport, all involving carbon. Are you willing to get your economic teeth into that and publish something soon, please? taking formal retirement, but I, I'm sure you'll carry on, um, absolutely. Okay, I can take a third question, then we'll, we'll take those in, in a group. Who's next oh, on this side? There was a hand here, over there, yeah. Uh, hi, my name's Ethan. I'm a first-year student studying government and economics here. Um, I'd just like to know, so would you discourage any form of carbon tax, um, even maybe... Uh, more conservative um, solution that was uh, recently proposed um, by Ted Halstead and a few other economists, um, which would uh, provide like a carbon dividend program, giving citizens um, back the money that they would raise from a carbon tax. Um, do you think that would have any like positive incentives um, for society, or do you, do you still think that would raise significant problems? Okay, thank you. Would you like to take those three first? Yes. Um, well, data is, of course, um, uh, an issue, but the arguments were analytical, which I used, not so much uh, based on data, and uh, I think they are true. Uh, what you cannot... <laughs> I mean, these I incentives are there, and uh, you d d just uh, need to assume that uh, the uh, oil shakes and the others are somehow interested in their own well-being, and then the, this results. I, did, I don't need very strong uh, data to make the point here, I would say, but it would, of course, help. Uh, the other point here, uh, transportation, is an, a big issue. Uh, I give you some numbers. In Germany, electricity, you're right, is only a fraction of the entire uh, carbon uh, or, or energy use. It's just 22%, one-fifth of the entire energy, final energy use in Germany, and also in the OECD countries. One-fifth is electricity, and four-fifths is something else. What is it? It is uh, burning uh, uh, coal for heat. Uh, which one needs for households and for uh, process uh, for for firms uh, which have uh, processes that need heat. It, it twenty nine percent is transportation, which you mentioned, and uh, the, we. That in a sense, if we if we see the broader picture, that uh, uh, re-emphasizes my frustration. Because even if we succeed in making the electricity 100% green, you know, then 80% is not yet green. It is something else. And uh, the idea of having the traffic, for example, with uh, electric cars, which some people en endorse, uh, I, I simply cannot uh, understand. Because if one wanted to increase the overall electricity production from 22% uh, to something like 50% in order to make the traffic also electric. That would be necessary. You know? Where do we get the electricity from? Even the 20% we cannot handle with wind and solar power. Uh, the extra 30, where should the electricity come from? Uh, not from wind and solar, because this extra wind and solar which we would need uh, we could not buffer anywhere. B the storage project on which I resorted uh, gives us a maximum geological possibility, uh, uh, a maximum uh, possible amount of, of uh, storage, and uh, we cannot scale this up if we just wanted to make the, uh, uh, the traffic also electric. So, uh, it always escaped me why people think that by having electric cars they could reduce the carbon output. Sorry, I, I, I failed to see the logic. I mean, of 
the only logic could be to do it nuclear. So the French have a lot of nuclear power. They can increase the nuclear power. They can have electric cars, and they, they can have nuclear cars, in a sense. But uh, Germany doesn't want to have nuclear. Uh, we would have to run them with wind and solar power, but uh, we will not be able to buffer this. OK, you could say they have their, their batteries, and they can store the energy when it comes. <laughs> but uh, what pe many people don't see is we have not a daily fluctuation, we do not have a weekly fluctuation of importance, we have a seasonal fluctuation. So we have an excess supply of green energy in September, and uh, the stores would all be empty in March. So in September you could fill your car batteries, and they would have to last the whole winter. No, impossible. Impossible. Uh, the, the, the difficulty is uh, is so enormous. This the contribution of electric cars is zero, uh, close to zero. I don't see it. I'm willing to learn if someone has a better argument here. I I'm willing to learn, but I, this is beyond the point. Uh, yes, if we want to do all nuclear. That I would understand. Then, in the end, we can do everything with electricity. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the carbon tax, this extra carbon tax which has been proposed here, well, it's about the same. Even if you rebate the revenue uh, to the people who pay, then you would have the incentive effect. Uh, but you wouldn't have an income effect, and that is the advantage of this proposal. But the incentive effect doesn't work because it's a demand-reducing effect. Yeah? If Britain does that, introduces such a tax, Britain's demand for fossil fuel in the world market declines, the world market price goes down, and other people in the world consume more. Unless the resource owners decide as a reaction to the price cut to produce less. But again, it's a scarcity price like with the Rembrandts. There is not much cost by taking it out of the ground. It's already there. Uh, to extract a barrel of oil in the Sahara or in, in, in the Gulf countries, you need three dollars. <coughs> And the market price of oil of a barrel is 54, it was, the lowest was 40, then 50, 60, and it was already 140. You, in order to, to get a supply reaction, you would have to depress the world market price below the extraction cost. But there is such a wide margin uh, between the market price and the extraction cost because these are scarcity prices. You won't reduce the number of Rembrandts around today by reducing the price of Rembrandts. It does not react. And then comes the additional difficulty of uh, anticipation effects, also with such a tax. If you begin with a little tax, the world gets warmer, people see, oh, it's not enough, we have to increase the tax rate because uh, more tax makes more uh, effect, but it will backfire because uh, the oil shakes and the others who anticipate that uh, extract even more. That's the danger of, such, of a tax solution. You cannot convincingly commit yourself to a fixed tax rate forever. You begin with something and there's no way to politically commit yourself to this rate. Uh, so you cannot exclude the possibility that the resource owners fear that this is just the beginning of a new era when the tax rates will increase more and more as the world gets warmer and the people get more nervous. And then you get the green paradox. No, no, that doesn't, I'm, I'm deeply convinced that that is a false belief to uh, go via, via a carbon tax. You have to do it with quantity constraints. I know there are different opinions. There is a strong group of economists nowadays who advocate the carbon tax, but they just uh, don't speak about the green paradox. They uh, put it to the side. Can I, can I just, as a footnote, 
mm -hmm. ask you that you, you proposed a worldwide emissions trading system as a as a possible solution but as i understand an emissions trading system is just like a carbon tax in that it puts a price on carbon it's a different way of establishing the price why would that help us when the carbon tax doesn't yeah, because it is a f it fixes the the worldwide quantity the price is endogenous whatever it comes out of uh, market reactions but the quantity you have uh, you, you have fully under control yeah. and you can uh, determine the path as you wish it whatever happens to the so price. with a global carbon tax if we were able to agree that if we would generate the same convincingly be able to commit to a time path of the global carbon tax which is the same as the one resulting from a quantity regime. Yes, it would result in the same, but you cannot commit to such a thing. Okay. And, and then you can get the, uh, uh, the green uh, counter reaction, the, the green paradox counter reaction, over reaction, mm -hmm. which you won't get if you have um, emissions trading system. Okay, good. Uh, well, there are lots of other questions. Um, uh, let's get on with that. Okay. The lady over there, and then I'll come to the front here. Hi, I'm Alessandra Kortenhorst, uh, not a student at LSE, but working um, in a systems change environmental consultancy. And you've spoken exclusively tonight, um, depressingly, uh, about uh, the developed world. But obviously, a lot of the future demand uh, electricity for electricity is going to come from the developing world, where infrastructure doesn't currently exist, where you're building it from scratch. Uh, how do you see that this picture looking for the developing world? If I'll I mean, I'll the I'll a few questions. Uh, I've seen Sam Funkhauser there. Mm -hmm. Could you go to the front, and then I'll make my way over here. So I'm Frank Hauser from the Grantham Research Institute. I want to invite you to comment on three of the assumptions that sort of seem to underlie what uh, is, is most of your results. Uh, the first one on, on, the, on the intermittency paper. Uh, Which paper? The, the, the first paper, the one of the volatility of, of solar and, and wind. Um, the assumption there is that uh, cheap storage is not possible. I'd like you to invite uh, to, to comment on the, the cost of batteries that have come down very fast. The second assumption in the leakage paper seems to be that there's a, a certain number of countries, the Trump countries as you call them, that do not have any constraints. I'd like to invite you to comment on the Paris Agreement where most countries have adopted um, quantity uh, ambitions for themselves. On the green paradox, the key assumption is that your supply curve is inelastic. I'd like you to comment on the fact that the hydrocarbon isn't all in the Sahara and $3 a barrel. There's also things like coal, tar sands, and a lot of sources of hydrocarbons that are actually expensive. Therefore, uh, you might have an upward sloping supply curve. Okay, that's already four questions. <laughs> <laughs> Very sneaky there. No, no. Yeah, uh, okay. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Would you like to take those yes, first? Yes, okay, yes. Okay. Then please. I'll start yes. another round there. Okay. Uh, the de developing countries, uh, yes, indeed, they they are part of the game here. They have to be in included. Um, I would say the willing countries uh, in the Kyoto Agreement were about uh, uh, responsible for thirty percent of the uh, world CO2 output. That was certainly not enough. One has to go towards 100 and one has, uh, I mean, realistically, if one takes China in, the United States in, India in, then one is at the, in the range of 70% of, of the carbon output of the world. And then if they all agree, then the final 30% uh, the developing countries which uh, account for them could be convinced to participate with the side payments or what have you, yeah? But it has to be all inclusive. Now the Paris Agreement is already promising uh, in terms of uh, uh, lots of statements, but uh, the question is will they be kept? 
The United States is not willing to keep the Paris Agreement, as we have heard, and there is no punishment mechanism, there is no binding uh, constraint to which the countries uh, really have to adhere. Uh, but it's a good step in the right direction. You know, I would add now a world carbon trading system to the Paris Agreement. And I think it is not impossible to do that because uh, the United Nations, uh, after Kyoto, had already uh, a, an emissions trading system for those 30% of the output which I mentioned. Because if a country could not satisfy the Kyoto Agreement, then it can negotiate with another country and uh, uh, extract more if the other country extracts less. So such um, uh, 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 bar gains between countries were explicitly uh, allowed already. We, so it's, it, it's a trading system that exists already between countries. And we have a trading system between um, individual uh, companies in Europe. So we have lots of experience of how such trading systems could be organized. And I'm, I, I think we could try uh, to enhance the, the Paris Agreement to have a worldwide uh, trading system being uh, attached to it. Um, if we have a tax solution, that also needs to be worldwide. If it is not worldwide, it won't, won't help anything. I, I don't see that it could help if it's just some, some countries uh, take the policy measures. Um, the extraction costs, the tar sands, you're right, tar, to extract tar sands costs about $15 per <coughs> barrel rather than three uh, in, in, the, in the Gulf countries. But this is also much lower than uh, the world price of carbon. No? We, we never really uh, brought the price to a level when it is not, not attractive to extract. And model-wise, if you uh, want to follow me about these models, then we do uh, have a time path of extraction starting with the good sites and going gradually over time to the more difficult sites, w those with higher uh, stock-dependent extraction costs, but over time the price also goes up. So it's not clear that we will ever reach a situation in the world where it's not profitable uh, in an undistorted uh, equilibrium where it's not profitable to take out some of the carbon. You know, my, I always think, I'll make, make a thought experiment. Can you imagine a situation where um, the, um, uh, the American president is willing to give up his uh, command over uh, uh, some fighter planes which reduce, uh, which, which consume fossil fuel simply because the e extraction cost is too high. No? I, 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 I don't think this will ever happen. The, when uh, the resources get scarcer, the price also goes up and we may always have a certain distance between the market price and the then prevailing extraction cost of the marginal side. So that um, policy measures that uh, bite into the wedge between the market price and the extraction cost uh, will have to bite the whole wedge away in order to make uh, uh, such sites unprofitable. But who tells us that this point could ever be reached? We do not, we know very little about uh, this future situation where uh, the situation will be so tight that uh, 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 for cost reasons one is not willing to extract the resources. Um, well, it's deeper than I can discuss here. If you want to look into my discussion of that in the book, uh, The Green Paradox, I have a debate of exactly this, your point. Okay. Okay, I've, I can take one more round, so we've got to be really quick. Let me start right there and then I'll, I'll come back to you. Um, Ian Morling, um, what, how, what hypotheses, what circumstances 
in what circumstances would you see Germany coming back to accept nuclear power? Okay, we can be quick on that, but uh, give it a moment. Uh, next, the young lady there. Yes. Hi, thank you. Thanks for your talk. Um, I'm a student at Imperial. And I was wondering, you haven't touched on direct air capture at the moment as a technology coming through. I did a quick Google as well on the storage capabilities. And I might be wrong, but they seem about the same scale as the total carbon reserves from what I could tell from the IPCC report. So I was wondering if you could comment bringing back in this question of CCS and direct air capture as a way of pinning the quantity that of carbon that can be. You know, so the carbon isn't just, if you, if you set the possibility of connecting supply to stuff that necessarily needs to be stored as a way of fixing a global price that isn't concerning for climate change. Okay, is there enough uh, carbon capture storage facilities in yeah. the world to deal with that problem? And just, if you could just bring it over here, thank you. Hi, I'm Gregor from the LSE PhD student here. Um, you mentioned the potential lack of a supply response. Um, to a carbon price because of the large margins. One of your um, proposed solutions, the tax on profits or on capital owners, um, wouldn't that have to be a very large tax then as well to bite substantially into um, their profit margins? Okay, all right. Three questions. Yeah. The point here about the price reaction is it's it's not the level of the tax which generates uh, the resource owner's reaction. It is the change in the tax that does that. While if you have a tax, this is a carbon tax, if you have a tax on financial assets, on the returns, it's the rate of the tax <coughs> rather than the change in the rate of the tax. And that makes it a much more easy instrument to talk about taxes on financial assets, uh, which scare investors away from financial markets. And I would say we, we do not even have to increase these taxes. We just have to switch from the residence-based tax system, which we nowadays ha have, to a source-based taxes. Actually, we have both. We have source and residence-based taxation. Suppose the whole world moved to source taxes. That is, uh, profits, interest, returns uh, are taxed where they are generated in the industry somewhere. Mm -hmm. Then it won't make a difference for the developed world because whether the tax is levied by the, ho uh, by the source or the resident country, if the rate is the same, it makes no difference. But for the oil shakes, it makes a difference because if we have source taxes, then they would have to pay it, while if, they have if we have destination-based taxes, then they can escape. They go to tax havens and so on, avoid the taxes. There are no tax havens anymore if we just have source taxes. All the tax havens die immediately because there's no reason. There's no profit being generated in tax havens. They just channel profits generated in the real industries through the havens to somewhere else. So that is... Um, uh, I, I believe it's a much more powerful tax instrument than, uh, uh, than a carbon tax. A, a carbon tax, as I said, it's not the level of the tax that generates anything. It is the change of the tax rate w from which the economic effects result. And it's very difficult to control that because you have to m make commitments about this future change. No one can make these commitments. It's, an, it, it's a policy instrument where we do not know at all how, it, uh, how the reaction will really be. Um, uh, carbon capture. Well, there is some IPCC um, uh, data on this. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure whether I memorized this precisely, but in the order. Uh, I think they found that 600 uh, gigaton gigatons uh, are possible as uh, for um, uh, carbon capture and storage, but what is the overall amount in the, in the Earth's crust? Between 6 and 13,000 uh, gigatons, uh, 10 to 20 times as much. So th yes, there is a little possibility. It would help us for a couple of decades but it is not the true overall solution. Um, 
nuclear power. Yeah, what will happen to switch uh, to make Germany re reconsider the decision? What will happen to make Britain reconsider the Brexit decision? <laughs> Uh, very difficult to say. There are conditions. If, if, if it really turns out to be uh, very problematic and nasty, then people may reconsider. But then you have to get rid of the old politicians. They all will have to uh, be uh, out of office or die. And then there's a new, new generation which uh, re-optimizes and then everything is possible. I give you an example. Take Sweden. Sweden was the first European country to exit the nuclear power after Harrisburg. They made a firm commitment, no longer we completely get rid of the nuclear power. What happened? Nothing. They uh, just spoke about it. They did not eliminate the nuclear power. And last uh, two years ago, there was an agreement by all parties to permanently stay in nuclear power and to revitalize and repair and, if necessary, build new all the 10 nuclear power plants which they had. After, you know, it takes one or two generations of policymakers in order to be able to reconsider. And I'm pretty sure that Germany will also do that. Yeah, All right. When? When? Okay. <laughs> this could be a good solution for Brexit too, but I think we've got no time <laughs> left for this topic. Uh, Hans Werner Sinn, it's been an, a tremendous pleasure to listen to you again after so many years, but also to remember just how controversial and insightful your remarks have always been. We've learned a lot. I hope you have enjoyed the evening. Could I just say before you join me in thanking our speaker that it is uh, RAG week at the LSE that is raising and giving. There will be a collection for a children's hospice outside, so as you leave, Grab some coins, some, some banknotes in your pockets and give generously. But please do join me in thanking our speaker tonight.